Oh, hello. My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Alrighty, guys, it's already time for a mid-month check-in here for J July? July? Yes, we're in, still in July. Ah, oh, what is time? Yeah, so it has actually been a really, a really good reading month for me so far. I've really enjoyed, it's interesting. I took a lot of pressure off myself to follow TBRs. And by doing that, I've actually ended up getting to a lot of the things that I have to, especially in terms of arcs. Like I feel like this was a month already that I've made a lot of progress on arcs. And we'll talk about some of them, I think, today. Maybe some I'll save for the end of the month. But uh, yeah, overall, super productive reading month. I've been reading a lot of mystery and uh, I've just been basically doing a lot of mood reading. So we will talk a little bit about what I've read, what I'm reading right now, and what I think I might read next, though that is obviously purposefully very open to interpretation these days. Okay, so in terms of what I've already read, maybe we'll, I'll mention a couple of things that I think I'm going to talk more about at my end of the month check-in. So my biggest disappointment of the year and of this month was a book called The Wrong Mr. Darcy by Evelyn Lozado. Lozada? Lozado? And I will talk more about this at the end of the month, but I kind of want to warn people now because it has been quite hype. I do see that it has a pretty low Goodreads rating, so maybe people, like, the message is getting out. But um, there was a big push, I think, from the publisher on this one, which is why I think there was a lot of noise about it. And this is just, like, in my opinion, as close to objectively as one can talk about these things, a bad book. And it is not really a Pride and Prejudice retelling as is described on the back. And it made me do an entire, like I read, um, there's this author named Lori Lillian who writes basically Pride and Pre Prejudice fan fiction. And uh, it's on Amazon. It's a nice like brain break for me. It's one of my favorite sort of like Kindle Unlimited kind of things. And uh, I read a full 600 page fanfic of Pride and Prejudice <laughs> after this book just to like give myself a palate cleanse. So I just wanted to mention that. I'll talk more about why I think it's bad at the end of the month, but I just want to start kind of getting the word out that if your tastes are similar to mine, not everybody's will be, but if your tastes are similar to mine, I don't think that one's great. Moving on to some upcoming, ro uh, an upcoming romance that is fantastic and I will talk more about at the end of the month, but I just got to tell you, spoiler alert from Olivia Dade is so good. I gave it four and a half stars and I think it's going to be a real crowd pleaser. I think that it gets internet culture and fandom in a way that I I think a lot of books don't and it's just it was such a pleasure to read it was so much fun I think I read this like pretty soon after The Wrong Mr. Darcy and it was just like oh yes okay this is more what I was hoping for in terms of the feeling I got from it so that was really good um I read Say No More from Karen Rose so I'll talk more about that at the end of the month but it's an it's the next in her I think it, it's gonna probably be a trilogy in Sacramento following these different like crime things relating to a cult. And it was, I think I probably liked the first one a little bit better than this one, but it was still really good. And she writes just such, her books are paced fascinatingly. So anyway, well, I'll talk more about that at the end of the month. And then um, The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. I talked about this in my mid-year freakout tag as the book I most wanted to get to before the end of the year, which spurred me. I was like, I should just go ahead and do that. And I really enjoyed this one. I don't, I mean, I, it's definitely one of my favorite things I've read this month. I don't know if I'll talk more about it at the end of the month though just because I don't know that I have a lot to say about this like I think it's just a really N.K. Jemisin's writing is just so her own and I think if you like her writing it almost doesn't matter what the book is because the writing is so interesting and I do just really like her writing. I think the thing that kept me from loving this is that it's a pretty like pretty on the nose metaphor. Now I do love the metaphor is always important to me in sci like speculative fiction sci-fi fantasy type titles like I want the metaphor to be interesting and it is but it's pretty on the nose or like on the text and I, I tend to like it to be a little more sub slightly more subtextual than it is and I think that kind of distracted me and kind of got me out of the flow of the story a little bit but maybe I don't need to talk about this at the end of the month because <laughs> I'm talking about now basically what I would have to tell you is like just if you like N.K. Jemisin, just give this a read. And if you're looking for speculative fiction that I think is different, I think this has just got a different vibe to it. I have read books with this kind of magic before. Murr Lafferty had a couple of kind of urban fantasy -y type titles that kind of had the same vibe. One was for New York and one was set in New Orleans. So if you like the magic system in here, I would point you towards those books from Murr Lafferty. But this is definitely one of my favorite things I've read so far this month. It was really good. And then I've read other stuff. So I read 
read uh, the latest installment of the Adventure Zone graphic novel series. I absolutely love the podcast that this is based on. And this particular arc, this is the third book in the series, this particular arc of the podcast, I net once I read this, I realized like, oh yeah, I read, I listened to the first like quarter of it. And then I got so behind in it, I decided I was just going to pick back up at the end. So I hadn't actually read or heard the story that's in kind of like the, from like 25% to 75% from the podcast, if that makes sense. So this was actually like quite delightful to see everything that happened in between the beginning and the end of this arc. And I still really love the art in these. And these are just so, the podcast is even funnier, but these are really fun, humorous takes on a high fantasy story. And this one I think is the funniest of the ones that I've read so far. Like I think it communicates the humor the best. There's a great scene that I remember from the podcast, but I think it captured it really well with Merle uh, sweet talking some um, plants, some magical plants. That was really funny. I don't know. It just made me laugh out loud. This put a smile on my face. This is probably my favorite of the three that have come out so far. And I can't wait till next year because next year's arc is the Crystal Kingdom arc, which is one of my very favorites in the whole series. So anyway, that was really fun. Let's see what else. I read an arc for Hidden by Laura Griffin and it was good. It was a, well, I can't really, hmm, maybe I'll save that as a surprise. It's an interesting book because I can't tell you about the things that make it the most interesting to me, but it was good. It's coming out in August. And uh, if you like Laura Griffin, I don't think you'll be disappointed by that one. Other arcs I read, I read Devil in the Dark by Kit Rocha. And Kit Rocha is a writing team that I've actually never read from, but I follow them on Twitter. Like I really like them on Twitter and they are very well-known, very well-loved authors of sort of like dark romance that has sort of like a usually kind of like a futuristic or urban fantasy grunge kind of vibe to it. And none of their titles have ever really appealed to me. I think I've got a couple of them for free and I've just never made time to get to them. So this is actually my first outing with them. And I thought that this was really good. I think I gave this three and a half stars because I think it's a book that is paced to be action packed. And I honestly think that probably there could have been some room to breathe. So the setup for this is that it is the future and there's been these like big power surges or like this uh, basically a collapse of the power infrastructure here in the US um, due to I think like some solar flares. So like all anything related to like digitized information or information in general is at a very high premium. And we are following uh, a trio of mercenary librarians who specialize in like getting information um, from ye oldie days and the ye oldie days being like now because <laughs> it's set in the future. So it's two different like squads of people who both have like their own reasons why they're kind of doing this cat and mouse thing. It is also a, it has like a strong romantic component to it like it is technically I guess a sci-fi romance because it's like dystopia and it is romance. You're very clearly seeing who else is going to get subsequent books <laughs> in this one and I do think that this was a lot of fun it just I don't I think if you like Alona Andrews this is the kind of book you will like I just don't think I think it made me appreciate how excellently Alona Andrews executes on action sequences because I just felt like that piece didn't fully work for me and then like I said I think pacing wise it was a little too much go 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 but it is a very interesting setup to a series. Like I would be interested to, I think, to continue reading in the series. It wasn't like a complete home run for me, but very intriguing. And I think people who like them will enjoy this. So that was another arc that I read that I thought was good. And then what else? I know I've, oh, audio wise. Okay, so I had been reading Secret Adversary and I finished that up at the very beginning of the month. And I'm doing, I'm vlogging that I'm finishing up all of the Christie's this year that I had not previously read and I'm vlogging it. So you'll get like my full thoughts, I think in that. But TLDR is that I think this is just not my favorite version of a Christie thriller. And it was also the second book she ever wrote. And I think you see even much more strongly than you did in The Mysterious Affair at Styles that this is an author who hasn't written a lot. So it was okay. I gave it a three star, but definitely not my favorite. And it is, interesting to me that Tommy and Tuppence of her sort of early characters that are in these thrillers are the ones who end up kind of getting books throughout the course of her career. So I'll be interested to see what the next ones are kind of like. One I liked better but do still have mixed feelings about was Death Comes as the End. Both of those audiobooks came out for me uh, from the library like right at the same time so I ended up kind of reading them back to back. And Death Comes as the End is fascinating because it's actually the first 
genre mystery that was historical. So it was the first time a like detective author, like a mystery author, had taken the conventions of that and then set it in the past. And Agatha Christie chooses to set basically a golden age detective fiction type story in ancient Egypt, which is something she knew a lot about because uh, her second husband was an archaeologist. They had a lot of archaeologist friends. It was something she read about a lot and she would go on the digs with him every year. So she like knew, knows a lot about the time period. And it's very interesting because it's just paced weird and it is, it takes so long <laughs> to get to the murder. And then once the murder happens, it just gets so murdery. I guess that's what you expect from an Agatha Christie book, but the body count in this one I felt like was really high. And I ended up, it was more, it's kind of like an odd like I didn't love it. I think I give it three and a half stars though because I appreciate that it's the first book kind of doing what it's doing and it is just sort of a weird book because it really does read like a bunch of rich English people set in ancient Egypt and she was doing that on purpose. I think she was trying to make the point of like people are people across time which is interesting but I don't know. It was it, it's not the kind of historical mystery that would get written today so I like respect it for that um but yeah it was kind of a weird reading experience. So anyway I read that and then the other other audiobook that I just finished yesterday was A Black Women's History of the United States by Dana Ramey Berry, I think is the first author listed. I think that's who I have on my spreadsheet anyway. And this was just super good, man. Like, I really enjoy those kind of retelling histories where what they're trying to do is show like, hey, you have this kind of narrative about the way history has progressed over a certain time period in a certain place with a certain topic, whatever the focus is. You have these sort of received meta narratives of history and what these a people's history of type projects do is say like, okay, th that's like the accepted narrative. Here are all of these examples where that wasn't actually how things always were. And these sort of counter examples of history recontextualize the overall view you have of history. I'm way into any project that does that. And this one is basically, I think, making the argument that black women have been a part of the history of the United States far before we must maybe necessarily even acknowledge that they were around because of who was getting to write things down and who was keeping records of what was happening, you know, in the 1600s when people who are not indigenous to America were first colonizing it. And um, I, I honestly found that part to be the most just like, I never had thought about this, but like the number of women with African origins who married to people who were coming to the United, what became the United States at that point, or who were enslaved, or who were indentured servants, or who were missionaries, or dot, like just thinking about that and re like, I mean, it's such an obvious point, but just one that I think they make really well of like, no, black women have always been a part of our history and like really try to put the spotlight on that. I just thought it was super well done and really interesting. They take um, a kind of a, you know, singular figure for each time period and follow their story, which I think is always like a smart approach and a way to like humanize the history. It just reminds you that like there have been amazing people in general and then the, in this case, amazing black women who have been bucking the narratives that we have about black women and like fighting for their voices to be heard and for them to like count. Anyway, it's one of those books that will make you mad, but also just like, I don't know, like honestly, as an American, it's like these kind of stories that make me proud because it's like, you know, the US has all these high ideals that we have never lived up to, but like in these individual stories, you see what to me is like the true American dream, which is somebody saying like, I am gonna make you cash your check America to me. Like you have said that everybody is free and everybody is equal and we are all the same under the law like I'm calling you on it I just like I love it and it makes me feel like oh our country is flawed but in individual people I think we see the promise of what we could be and like that's the kind of patriotism I'm interested in so from that respect I was like I found this to be a very it gives me hope for the future kind of read okay in terms of what I'm currently reading technically two books that I keep meaning to get back to because I made progress but did not finish one is Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas didn't get super far into this one but vibe wise this is really cool it's sort of a mystery thriller ish kind of of thing at an elite college in New England that seems to have like a lot of dark secrets kind of a thing. So I keep meaning to get back to this one. So planning to do that sometime soon. And then last night I meant to read like finish this, but instead I accidentally ended up binging Floor is Lava because it's 2020 and I need a brain break. Um, but anyway, <laughs> The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. I read um, I think probably like 30% of this before I had to give it back to the library in June and my physical copy arrived. I was really enjoying this, so I want to get back to it. But I think these are 
technically the only two I actually have in progress right now. And then in terms of what I might read next, I have a lot of grace for myself, as I've mentioned, this summer to kind of do what I want. But in terms of things I think I'm likely to get to sometime soon, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston is on my classics to read this year. This is one of my 12 classics I want to read in 2020. And I don't know, I've just kind of felt like this sounded like it might be good. So I've got this in the mix. The City in the Middle of the Night by Charlie Jane Anders is on my Operation Sci-Fi TBR. And I was hoping that I would get to this one this month to make some more progress on that challenge. So I think I'm gonna try to make, make some time to get to this. A couple of things that came in recently. One is the first edition or the first volume of the Wicked and the Divine graphic novel uh, series. So this is one I have been kind of wanting to start a new graphic novel series. And this is one that I believe is actually com completed. So I kind of like the idea of picking something that was either done or mostly done. And um, I've heard just great things about this on booktube. So I wanted to get into some graphic novel stuff and this is gonna be my next foray into that. So I think this will be a good one to slot in on a night where at the end of the day, I'm a little <laughs> brain dead and could use something a little less text heavy. I just received my copy of Trixie and Katya's Guide to Modern Womanhood. I love these guys, especially Katya. She is like one of my all time favorite like entertainers, I guess maybe is the way to say that. Uh, she's I guess not quite a singer, not quite an actress. I don't know what you would say, but in terms of just like overall entertainers, she is one of my very favorites. And so I'm really excited. I'm sure this is gonna be a very funny version of a memoir from these two amazing queens who will teach me um, all about biological womanhood. So hoping to get to that for sure. Uh, and then I do have some arcs. So I have one more arc I need to read for August, which is The Night Swim by Megan Golden, which is sort of a thriller with a true crime podcast component to it, which is often sort of a fun hook to me in a thriller. If I get time to start making progress on September arcs, guys. Well, one of them I'm gonna read is The Darkest Evening by Anne Cleave. I have that as a digital arc and it is a believe an isolated close circle mystery. So I think that will be fun. I'm reading a lot of mystery this month. Just been in a mysterious kind of mood, which plays into this. When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. I adore Alyssa Cole for her romance writing. She's just a queen who <laughs> I feel like can kind of do, do no wrong. And this is her first thriller and it's like a gentrification thriller. It's been described as a social thriller. I don't know. I'm just real excited for this. So I'm hoping maybe that might happen. And you know, I have other arcs. I would love to get to Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, The Awakening by Nora Roberts. I have a few other arcs that I possibly could also get to if the mood strikes. I have a nonfiction pick I'm working on right now called You Were Born for This, Self Astrology for Radical Self Acceptance by Chani Nicholas. And I'm, I'm enjoying this. I, you know, I grew up very religious, like very fundamentalist. And a big part of that religion just tradition is journaling, daily devotion. And since I am, I don't, I'm not really evangelical anymore. And a, a lot of the kind of habits of worship around that, I find really just not comforting anymore or not, I'm not really able to engage them like from a place of the heart as opposed to the head. I've been trying to find ways to get back into journaling or get back into like having deep self-reflection or introspection. And I've actually found that like thinking about astrology or Enneagram or any of those things, I found those to be like non-specifically religious ways to have like kind of more spiritual self-reflection. So I've been enjoying using this to kind of access that part of me or my inner thought life. Um, so I've been enjoying this. I don't, I think I've described my feelings about astrology before as play, playful belief. I don't really take it that seriously, but I think it's fun. And you know, I love riding or dying for like Virgo moon or my cancer sun or whatever. So yeah, I've been enjoying this as sort of a, a route to do that. And then just grabbing the top five books that are also, I kind of put at the top of my TBR pile of things like if I get in the right mood, I could see these being potential things that I might read. One is Indigo by Beverly Jenkins, which is a historical romance between an underground railroad conductor and one of the people who is fleeing from enslavement. And I've read one Beverly Jenkins back in the day and was just like, this is so emotional. I don't know if I can do this. And now that I kind of know what she does better, I think I'm, I'm better able to pick the right mood to read this. So I'm excited to get to this at some point. So that might come up. Another thing I've thought about reading is the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix. I think I'm really gonna like this. I just have sort of not been in the, it's kind of like horror-ish and I've just not been quite Quite in the right mood for that. So I don't know. I'm I'm waiting for the mood to strike for me to get to this one because I've heard almost nothing but great things. The Guest List by Lucy Foley is an isolated close circle thriller, I think more than an actual mystery, but you guys know I love that trope and 
Again, just sort of waiting for the right uh, mood to strike for it. Home Before Dark from Riley Sager is a spooky, like a creepy house kind of thriller. Say it again with me, the right mood. When I'm in the mood for that, I think I'll be reaching for that. And then The Boyfriend Project from Farrah Rashawn. This is a bunch of girls find out that they were all dating the same guy and like plot to take him down. And in the course, like she finds love. I've heard really positive feedback coming from this one for this one um, since it was released, which makes me so happy because Farrah Rashawn is one of those people that I followed for a long time on Twitter and have really enjoyed there. So I'm just, I'm so happy that she's getting such good reviews. And uh, yeah, this is the next time I'm in the mood for something kind of like light, fun, content. Temporary, I think I may pick this up. So yeah, those are all the ones that I kind of have on my radar to potentially be in the mood to read if it strikes. We're talking about a lot of books. I will not get to all of these this month, but we'll we'll see what I can do. Oh, and I guess I should also mention I just got The Lightning Thief out from the library as audio because I had so many people recommending me try it in that form. So yeah, I guess that will probably be my next audio pick. So there you go. Anyway, a lot of plans in the mix here for the rest of July. So you guys will definitely have to let me know how your July reading is going. Have you read anything great? so far? Do you have anything exciting that you are looking forward to picking up next? Let me know that in the comments down below. And yeah, I think that that will do it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below, along with a link to register to vote. And actually, I'm going to put, I was listening to a podcast last night that I thought was really good about looking at voting as harm reduction that I thought was like a really helpful framing because I know whenever we vote, there can be a lot of ambivalence about how do you pick, how do you vote for people that you may not totally agree with? Um, and I just thought it was a really uh, helpful lens, the idea of harm reduction. So I'll put that with the link to register to vote below. Yeah, okay, I think that that will do it for now. Hope you guys are having an absolutely lovely day today and I will just talk to you soon. Bye.